okay, it's how to get a movie deal, like two seconds before. Now we know the title, a minute before the show. <laughs> how you doing, John hey, Carlo? Thank you, Steve, for having me. Uh, so we've known each other for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's, let's bring all the guests on, and then we'll, we're going to start this conversation. So John Carlo, help me with the last name. Uh, okay, Yanata, but Ayanata <laughs> here uh, in Chicago, we can say that's fine, too. Okay, <laughs> so we have a lot of old friends, and we have some new friends. We're going to start with Elliot Rosenblatt. How you doing, Elliot? Good, how you doing? Good morning. Good. Why don't you just give people a quick rundown on some of the things you've done? I'm just going to say one thing, and, and, and we've known each other for a long time in that one time that you told me that you made Grace of My Heart, which is, I, I swear to God, that is one of my favorite movies. I love that movie, and you produced that movie, but uh, why don't you just give us a rundown of some of the other projects you've done? I'm glad someone likes that movie. Um, <laughs> I... I've been doing this a long time. So I've produced about 20 years, and you know, I did my favorite movie of all of them is The Cooler um, that I did with Bill Macy and Alec Baldwin. But uh, everyone knows me or knows the film Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, so you know that's been been around for a, for a while. But everybody kind of knows that film because it's the most famous. And uh, just keep working, producing, 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 and we just produced the movie. I produced, did a movie with uh, Bruce Logan, who's on the show as well. Great. Okay. Well, now we're going to move to Bruce Logan. Bruce, uh, we're best mates. We do all kinds of stuff together. We've worked on a bazillion projects together, which is pretty amazing. But why don't you tell people about you? Uh, well, I started off in animation, and I worked on a, um, a movie called 2001, A Space Odyssey, where I got my first screen credit. Independent film. As a 19-year-old. <laughs> And then I worked, uh, my claim to fame is that I blew up the Death Star and, uh, well, it's called The New Hope now, but it was just Star Wars back in the day. And um, uh, specifically for this show, uh, Elliot and I just finished making a movie called Lost Fair, which are, uh, I guess we're going to talk about our uh, distribution journey on. Okay, great. And we have a new friend, Alan. Uh, Ooh, I got that, I got that right, didn't I? Absolutely. Hi, uh, my name is Alan, Alan Holt, and I'm an independent filmmaker, an emerging filmmaker um, based in uh, the Bay Area. And my film, Enamorata, was uh, recently distributed through Issa Rae Productions. And um, I'm also coming at this through education. I'm associate director at Stanford, the Institute for Diversity in the Arts. Okay, terrific. And I'm not going to forget this time, Rachel. We got Rachel Marr, our digital marketing director. Hi, everybody. I'm following all the chat that's uh, welcoming everybody right now on Facebook, and I'll be passing your questions and discussion points and comments along to Steve and all our guests during the show. So as the discussion process uh, progresses, just ask me whatever you want to know, and I'll pass it along. Yes, please join the conversation. The whole point of this this live thing, which is amazing to me, I still can't believe that we can do this. That is awesome. This is really uh, <laughs> I know. the best that I, I've ever been on. <laughs> is that we, that the, the newness of this is the interactivity. And in the previous shows we've done, it's like great. It's like we have people from Turkey or wherever and they boom, they got a question and we're going to answer it right here, right now. So get in the comments and ask your questions. Uh, okay, so let's talk about what we're going to talk about. So you've made a project, you made a movie, you made it uh, a TV pilot, you made a live show, you made something. Now what? What do you do? Uh, and what I want to do is, is I want to roll a clip, and then we're going to sort of react to it a little bit. So let's roll that clip. Where are the film audiences? Where did they exist? Is it on Amazon? Is it you know, on, on Vimeo, how do you find people that, that want to watch documentaries? And so, yeah, I'm in the middle of a quest. I'm, a, I'm, in, I'm in a quest to find where the audience is. Everyone knows what Amazon is. So if you're there, it's sort of like, it's possible for people to interact with your film. It's possible for people to watch your content because it's in a, it's in a something that they know of. If I said our film's available on VHX to, to a normal audience member, they'd be like, don't know what that is. Okay, so this is interesting. First thing I want to say is this is like, I hear different things on the web. I hear a lot of people griping that it's very hard 
right now. But I look at this as the most exciting time ever because the need for content with all of these different distribution channels is incredible. And let's talk about some of these distribution channels. And the first one I want to talk about is the movie theater. So uh, now Elliot and Bruce, uh, you've obviously made movies in the movie theater. And I know Elliot, we've had these conversations where you talk about the $250,000 movie. And I want to just talk a little bit about, <clears throat> not long, about the movie about the movie theater, and then we're going to move into things like subscription TV and the Vimeo model and things like that. Elliot, what do you got to say about making a movie and getting it in a movie theater? Well, I, I agree with that. What that kid just said that I, I think it's really hard to do that right now. I mean, there's there's uh, the studios are making less movies and making big tempo movies. So a small movie without any star in it, with it without any kind of reference for people to go to is kind of lost in the shuffle. I don't see you getting a distribution deal theatrically at all, really, unless you have some kind of element that they could sell. And there's just so many movies that are made that we never see, but are distributed foreign that, um, because that model still works there in terms of that you can have a star, I mean, even if he's in it for a day and you can use the name on the poster, that film will get sold throughout all foreign markets, but you might never see it here. You might see it here on on cable or on some kind of video on demand, but otherwise you won't even see that. So for someone to just make a, a film that breaks out is really a rare kind of thing. But, okay. You know, it happens. You hear about it, it happens. Like, things like that, you know, they break yeah. out. I, I, I don't want to talk about those rarities. You know, sometimes I have these conversations where I tell people, if you think you're going to make a movie and get it in a movie theater, you're nuts. And you shouldn't even try. And they go, well, look at Blair Witch and look at this and look oh, at yeah. that. Okay, you, <clears throat> I say, give me five examples in the last 10 years. That's right. not any sort of a model that you can gauge life on. Now I want to talk to you, Giancarlo, because you made this can I movie. Just say one thing? Yeah, go ahead. Just that I, I think people should still think that, that they can have that opportunity and they have that chance and be, be that lucky person because I think that's what drives you to get the thing done and made. The reality of it is it's probably against you, but I think they should still have the hope that that could happen. It's just a good thing to have. Yeah, I mean, I like what you said where, you know, it's, and, and this is kind of a huge deviation, but it's like, you have X amount of money. And we were actually gonna do a show on this, but it got canceled, but we're gonna redo it at one point. It's like, where do you put your money? Me, I would, I don't care like what he said. If you gotta put 60% of your money into getting a star for a day, that's something you can hang your hat on. It's right. really important. But I, I wanna go to you, John Carlo, cause you made this really wonderful movie I mean, I'll be honest with you, I went with Melissa, I sat in that audience, and we already had figured out our exit strategy <laughs> uh, in case this thing sucked, and I was yeah, so sure yeah. it was going to First time suck. Uh, feature film, right? First time director. And I, I we loved it. We just loved it. It was just this really charming, beautiful story, and real, I guess, but I could care less. That's irrelevant to me. A story's a story. But here you sit now. You have a movie made. What are you going to do? Right, right. Well, the movie's called My Country, if I can plug it briefly. It's an Italian-American road trip comedy. I got to film it in Italy and this little region called Molise, where my <coughs> father's from. And we've had a number of premieres, so you were talking about getting in a movie theater. I mean, I'm still, I, I still have that romanticized version of, you know, you make the movie, you want to show it in a theater. But there aren't that many opportunities, like you're saying. And one of the, um, we, we had the opportunity to have Joe Montaigne come to our premiere uh, in L.A., and I was thinking after the movie, you know, if we would have had him for one day, you know, mm -hmm. we probably could have sold the movie, could have been like the father in our film um, because it's such an uphill battle. You know, we have no stars, you know, all unknown actors, and I'm also in the film. Um, and, and even if people are really enjoying it, you know, they say, oh, we love the movie and it made us laugh, made us cry. Can you sell it, you know, overseas? Can you, you know, market it somewhere where, you know, uh, where people are watching movies, and it's really hard to do that now uh, without right. well, you star told power. Me because he did a film in my neighborhood, and everyone in my neighborhood 
knows him really well and we could have probably arranged that. So there's a perfect example of how you need to network before you get started. And we right, have another clip right. where somebody's gonna talk about that. Uh, Alan, let's talk about your picture. Actually, you, you, didn't, you sort of sold yourself short there a little bit because I know that you're involved in something that I'm really passionate about, which is the theater, uh, and music, I, I think, and you know, the theater to me is everything. But I mean, I, I, I love film too. So tell us a little bit more about your film and the things that you're doing. Absolutely. So I, I do come from a playwriting background. I'm a playwright by training. Um, did a two-year fellowship at the Public Theater, which I consider to be my artistic home in terms of the theater. Um, and as I've been moving into film again, an emerging filmmaker, um, it's really been kind of re reimagine what our successes are. So for me, thinking about taking this question in a different approach, um, thinking about the theater, for me that's exciting because our cinematography is gorgeous. So my short film, Anamorata, um, which is out now on Issa Rae, uh, YouTube channel. Um, for me, the, the theater is, is important because we get to see the work fully realized and the work that we're making is for a large format. And so for me, that's the most exciting thing about, about me being able to show, even for one day or a couple of days in the festival circuit um, on a large format film. So it's a little bit detached from the, the business aspect of it. Um, but in terms of being able to take, you know, knowing the limited opportunities in that space and be able to transition to a digital space and have it reach audiences immediately and also have that interactive quality that you talked about, getting immediate feedback, sometimes at length, having audience members um, have full length conversations in the comment section. For me, that's that's huge success. And I see that that leads to, to other metrics that we can use to, um, as we think about our full feature film. Okay, well, that's a good point you brought up because uh, in, in, in the previous show that we did, we played a clip from our, our first web series, Film Fellas, and the very first thing I said, and that was 10 years yeah, ago, yeah. was, would you rather have a thousand people watch your movie in a movie theater or a million on the web? And shockingly in the comments, a lot of young people said a thousand people in a movie theater. I'm the old one, and I said, hell, I'd rather have a million people on the web right, to right. get now, the comments. Right, hundred million back. now, I mean. Uh, well, yeah, that's hard, but let's, yeah. even 250,000 is good. Right, right, right. But the but, point is, is I agree with you. Uh, you know, I mean, let's get real. The movie theater is what Elliot said. It's going to be for Iron Man, and that's where the big bucks are going now. But let's talk about what Elon was just talking about, uh, YouTube, Vimeo, and the grand mall, you know, Amazon, Netflix. Netflix yeah. uh, Bruce, how do you feel about that? Well, you know, uh, having, a, having a film in the theater is, you know, these days for a filmmaker, I think <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's kind of unrealistic. I think that's why people enjoy going to festivals because they do get to see their uh, movies on, um, on, on the big screen. Um, but, um, and you know, I, I like watching my movie uh, on the big screen because I've made it for the big screen. You know, it's, it's in 4K and, you know, to think of someone watching my movie on their phone is like, uh, uh, it's offensive, but if they're paying the uh, uh, if they're paying the entry fee, I think it's, uh, it's fine, you know? Okay, Rachel, what do you got? Yeah, I had an interesting comment from Bill Ron who says, uh, what the most important thing is the story. A-list actor films have totally bombed because the story was not king. So do you guys think that's maybe kind of a romantic way to look at it when it comes to distribution specifically, or is story still the bottom line? Well, obviously, well, I'll tell go you, ahead, Bruce. Oh, yeah. Mike up in, yeah. Um, you know, we thought about putting somebody in Lost Fair, but if, you know, our movies like a, a very kind of rough, raw, uh, realistic uh, story, even though it has fantasy elements to it. So to put like a Michael Shannon in there, for, you know, in, in a little part would completely take you out of the movie. So for, for me, it was a conscious choice not to do that. You know, I mean, if, you, if you're going to do a movie that's an ensemble thing with, um, with you know, known actors, that's one thing. But we, we decided not to do that. Okay, now this is weird too because Michael Shannon lives a couple blocks away from me. So again, you should have said something. 
Uh, <laughs> next movie. Next you movie. know Chloe and Riley, uh, Bruce? Yeah. yeah. He used to live in their attic. Oh, great. And I remember him telling me, oh, I'm, I want to be an actor. This is 15 years ago. Okay, so I would, I mean, obviously, uh, I can't remember. who. What's the name of the uh, person with the question, Rachel? Bill. Uh, obviously, story is first. I mean, come on. You know, you, you, you need a great story. Uh, but then this star power thing is really important. I mean, just think of your movie had you had Joe Montaigne. When I worked here 10 years ago, um, the first thing you told me is forget the cameras. Cause you, you, were, you were trying to sell the products too. Forget the camera, forget this. It's about the story and the acting, right? So I tried to apply that to my movie. You know, we didn't have a lot of money for a 4K camera, um, you know, big effects or anything, but we could spend the money getting people and talent. I went to the AFM film market, you know, in Santa Monica, and again, I don't want to be pessimistic here, but you know, your movie is a comedy. Comedies don't sell well here. You know, you don't. It's not an action or a thriller film, so it doesn't translate exactly. You know, so at the same time, you have to think of all those other things too, uh, besides story and you know, and acting. Well, in your case, I mean, it just okay. In the in the perfect world, I. You go to Italy and you say, would you like to be in an American film? Everyone wants to be in an American film. This sort of what I call the crossover movie, which is this, you know, the crossover market to me is amazing, like the Jane the Virgin market, things like that. Had you done that and got yourself some kind of an Italian star, then we get back to Elliot now with the foreign sale. Because Elliot, I know, this is his whole thing. I want to sell the foreign rights before I even start. And I've got a budget. Elliot, what about that? Well, my question is, did you sell your film to Italy? Even there, it's been it's been tough there as well. Um, we're planning to actually self-release it just because, again, people are very complimentary. They like the movie, but they don't want to put money behind it because they just seem to can't sell it, um, you know, without a name attached. I don't know. Just, I, I, I'm with you, Steve. I, if there was an opportunity there to maybe sell it to Italy before you got the movie made. But... Um, Look, it, it's all changing, though, as as we speak right now. I mean, there's there's so many different ways to go. And in terms of story, and I think a lot of that has to uh, is like an American thing. But if you have a really good, if you have a star and the story's not so good, but you have enough action in it, you're selling that picture foreign tomorrow because it's dubbed anyway. So people, people, you know, you see all these big action films. It, they have what? Half of its dialogue, half of its effects sound is blowing things up. So, you know, those things, that, that model still works. Not as much here as anymore, but it works overseas. But well, that's hard. in terms of the little, little films, it's, this, it's, it's a whole, we're talking about all of us made oh, these okay. small films that are essentially kind of dramas or personal films. And that's a different market altogether. All right. And, uh, but I, I'd rather see have a million people see it on the, on the web than, than a thousand people in the theater. Okay, I want to segue with that because I want, what I want to do is start talking about why are we so into making movies? I just shot a TV pilot. I mean, the hot ticket right now is binge watching really interesting movie quality tv shows tv shows much, and you yeah. don't need stars you know what i'm saying the, there you it, it, if it's great people get sucked in and it's so funny i hear people say i don't really want to commit to watching a 90 minute movie i'll just watch an episode of this and then they end up watching yeah, five hours yeah, yeah roll clip two and then we're going to come back how do you get a film financed and how do you get distribution for a film? So that's the that's the main thing. There's no clean cut way to do either of those things. Approaching a distributor in advance is something that really helps. I had my movie Pernicious, which is coming out in theater soon, and I said, hey, if I made a film in the same genre, would you buy it? And they said yes, and so they pre-bought the film. It was very easy to finance them based off of they were already sold before they were made. He said specifically what he was looking for, as opposed to making up a movie that you're like, this is my passion project, it was, uh, here's what the distributor wants. Okay, so that was kind of going back to what we were talking about a little bit before on other ways of, you know, pre-selling a movie. There, there's a couple of examples that really get me 
excited and the one is in the faith-based market which is this yeah. movie courageous i don't know does anybody know about this movie courageous there's a bunch of them i mean uh they sold like they pre-sold something like five hundred thousand dollars worth of tickets before the movie ever came out on facebook it, it was incredible yeah. you know yeah now he's talking about doing like a micro budget movie this bethany which actually the star of bethany was in my uh <laughs> Uh, a TV pilot that I just shot, uh, which is kind of like a Friends reboot, but a little nastier. Um, so uh, the, the point is, is we're getting back to this whole idea of pre-sell. They're dealing in micro budgets. So they go to somebody and they're like, look at, um, you know, I need 25000 or I don't know how much money they're asking for. And to an investor, they've had a little bit of success. They're like, you know what, fine, take the 25000 If I make something, fine. If not, fine. Um, Elliot, what do you think? Um, was Jack Lee's the question there? I'm not quite sure <laughs> your question is. Well, I know that you're, you're more into, we've had conversations about this under $200,000 movie. These kids are talking about micro-budget movies. But if, you're, if we are just going to, top off this movie conversation and then go TV forward. Uh, what do you think that the, the hot ticket item is for making a low budget movie and what is that number? God, I have no idea how to make a movie for $25,000. I don't know how these guys do it. I mean, um, it, I think first of all, you gotta be under 30 years old to be able to do that because um, you're just going on pure willpower at that point. But, um, and getting all your friends to work with you, but I, um, I, I, I don't know. I think it's like a, becomes a real niche thing. I mean, it's got to be a, a really, really specific subject that enough people are interested in, even if no matter how weird it might be, that to be able to get enough people to watch it. But otherwise, I, I mean, I don't really know how to make a. I have no idea how to do these little tiny micro projects and actually yeah. have it. My project is on that size. Elon, uh, how much was your project? Yeah, my project was around that size, twenty-five thousand. Um, and I think what really helped us was um, was working laterally, so very much invested in other emerging artists, um, and also looking at. And this is the trick that I learned from theater, but also tapping into non-traditional actors. So um, our lead in our film, Enamorada, the actress is Sabina Carlson, which who has a huge following as a uh, international curve model and is also a really wonderful actor. So in able to, um, we were able to use the currency that she holds um, as, as a well-recognized public figure and also support her in, in moving into her acting career, which I think it was able to, we were able to kind of leverage the star power in an untraditional way and also um, support our digital distribution through our currency, which for us is views, um, to be able to leverage other projects. Um, you know, so it is, it's working literally. Um, and that's something that, that is actually very much a part of our values and ethics um, growing up together. I mean, that's an interesting topic. We tried to get a, I don't know, what do you call them, an internet celebrity, a blue check marked person, a verified person. And it's unbelievable. It's, it's cheaper to get Robert De Niro than to get these people. I mean, they were talking 40 grand and they had you know, maybe a, a couple million followers or not even. And then we were like, <clears throat> what kind of engagement can we expect when somebody's doing this going like, like, like? And it was like so microscopic what their agent told us. We were like, I mean, if you know one of these internet celebrities, now we did actually end up getting somebody who was a verified person uh, just like, Alan, but the difference is, is you got to find that person that really wants to segue from the modeling business into the acting business. Very hard to, to find that person. Yeah, so yeah. what Alan was saying about the niche market too, so I made a film for under 100 uh, and we raised the money. I thought of everybody here in Chicago and in Elmhurst where I'm from who'd give me $1,000 and some people gave 2000 you know, some people gave 5000 and the one thing that's been, you know, working for us is that we've been hitting the Italian market, right? Obviously Italian movie, road trip fun. And when we went to San Diego to show the film, you know, people were, were so enthusiastic because they're like, oh, you know, we get all these L.A. movies and pe people just seem so, you know, there just was a negative connotation about what's happening with movies. And they're all about, you know, marketing and this and that. And people seem to really enjoy it. And so we were able to target that one market, which has helped us. Um, you know, maybe that's something, too, that filmmakers can, can 
when before they're making the movie think Absolutely, about. Absolutely, man. I'm so glad you said that because, and I say this every single time, the film business with the operative word on business. If I hear another person say this story has to be told, I'm going to slap them. No story has to be told. The only stories that have to be told are ones that can make money. We don't do this for fun. I mean, maybe some people do it for fun. I don't want to do this for fun. But like a little, just a little bit, a little bit. But uh, yeah, I mean, okay. <laughs> but I want to talk to Alan about something because um, Melissa and I watched this show on the web called Brown Girls, and uh, very few views. But we looked at that thing and we were like, wow huge marketing capacity Absolutely. two weeks two weeks later hbo announces they bought this show with i mean we're talking 500 type views not a lot of views when it was on but just well written hit the marketing buttons with people of various colors and it just to hbo that was a a, a i don't want to say you know for rich people, but it was for rich people because you had to have cable, then you had to have HBO. This was prior to the HBO you could buy for 10 bucks. Absolutely brilliant move. If I were those girls, I heard they were approached by HBO. I would have approached HBO. Alan, mm -hmm. I know you know them. Absolutely. Um, and I, I, so Brown Girls with Sam Bailey um, and Fatima Asghar. So an incredible success story in that right. Um, and I think we underestimate to the fact that folks are looking to discover the next, I mean, not underestimate, but folks are looking to discover the next big thing, and especially um, by voices who have historically been underrepresented. It's um, an opportunity to go straight to the source and to be able to support talent before it even has a chance to gain momentum on its own. Um, and so, again, I think it goes back to just having a strong story, of which Brown Girls has a tremendously strong story, and also a lot of grassroots support, which it does. Um, not only is a Sam an amazing um, and accomplished filmmaker in Chicago and, and now the world, um, Fatima has a, a huge uh, background in the spoken word scene, so it's um, and slam poetry scene, both in Chicago and internationally. So there's a lot of momentum that has been um, happening to get those folks to that place. And I think it's supporting all of us, um, especially as diverse filmmakers um, and creators, uh, to be able to tell our stories on any platform that we find ourselves in the moment and then be able to scale that to, to size. Absolutely. So. I applaud those girls. That They are marketing geniuses. Oh, and I didn't even mention the fact that it's girls. You know, right. I mean, they hit so many beautiful marketing points and did it with a good story. That, I, I, I almost applaud their marketing, their, their business model, more than their, their film, but their, 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 their uh, web series. But their web series was very entertaining, and I know because I watched it all. If it's not, I sort of fall off. Um, exit strategy, right? Here. Yeah, exactly. It's my exit <laughs> yeah, yeah. strategy. Let's roll Let's the next clip. It. From day one, like even right now, I'm planning the distribution of it. Yeah. And it's not, the aim is not to try to sell it to a distributor. Like that, for me, like the model for that, if you're making a movie like Obsolidia, No Stars, again, like an original kind of quirky film. And that was, you know, lots of distributors came to us and they're like, we like your film, we have no idea how to sell it. <laughs> you know, like, you know, that was it across the board. We, you know, it's a great film. We have no idea how to sell it. If I had not heard that, uh, the last six months of my life, yeah. Yeah. I want to roll the last clip now, and uh, we're going to talk about that. I don't know if I'll ever have a film in a festival again. It's just not something I'm that interested in. I think festivals are something that used to keep us relevant, and now we're kind of there to keep them relevant, and I don't want to be part of some elitist hierarchy or anything like that. We're not looking for distribution. We're, we are the distributors. So what are we going there and doing necessarily, you know? Yeah, I think the whole audience is online, <laughs> you know, for all these things. We're realistic. These films are never going to be in theaters. They're not going to be a big theatrical draw. They're made for online audiences, you know? Okay, he cut part of that clip out that I really wanted, which is he said, uh, you know, you go to festival, you collect all your laurel leaves, and then all of a sudden you figure, oh, okay, I'm going to get all these people coming to me, and it never happens, you know? Um, I want to talk a little bit about this whole festival market, and then I want to get to uh, Alan about uh, how she's distributing. You're distributing your project on YouTube, right? Um, YouTube and also Comcast Xfinity. Okay. 
Uh, so, like, let's talk about this festival scene. I know you've gone to the festivals. I know Bruce has gone to Just the festivals. Came back, yeah. I know that Elliot's with Bruce going to the festivals. And um, is the festival scene, like he says, I mean, in a way, it's a business. You know, there used to be, you know, Chicago, New York, L.A., Cannes, you know, and then eventually Sundance. But And these things w- weren't businesses. But now it's like he said, you collect your laurel leaves, you enter 47 film festivals, blah, blah, blah. What Are, are we supporting the film festival business or are they supporting us? Having just gotten back, uh, we just showed the film at our last festival, the Brooklyn Film Festival, just got back yesterday. Um, the one thing, too, is that you get the opportunity to show it with a crowd. We had, we had a big crowd, two showings, um, and, you know, we, we decided to self-release the film, and we got such a kick out of, you know, like uh, a boost from the festival, a lot of interviews, a lot of press. So I'm going to disagree with Sean on that aspect, because I do think there's still a relevancy, um, and especially if you're, you know, showing your film at South by Southwest, Sundance, I mean, you have an opportunity to sell the film there, too. Um, and... Yeah, I think it's there is still definitely. Um, I think it's still worth. I mean, the fees and everything. It's a whole other thing, and it is kind of a money grab. But um, you know, I think there is still something there for filmmakers. And okay, Bruce. Well, <clears throat> uh, we entered quite a few film festivals, and um, um, I th- I think it's an opportunity to see your movie in front of an audience. But uh, as, as a sales tool for us, we, I don't think we saw any press at any of the festivals that we uh, entered. So as far as marketing the movie, you know, it, 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 wasn't, uh, it wasn't good for us. But um, uh, we got the laurel leaves on the poster and that kind of helps. You know, you can kind of see them all lined up on the side there. And, um, <laughs> Um, well, that, uh, I, I, that's the best part of the clip. I can't believe he cut it out, but he was like, uh, Rachel, what do you got? I have an interesting question from Bob Franco, <clears throat> who says, I produced a comedy series, Boomer Love, eight five-minute episodes so far, and have run into roadblocks because we don't have the right agent. I have, experience, I have an experienced agent, but HBO and others told us she was not known to them, so they wouldn't even look at the show. How do I get to the Netflixes of the world? That's interesting because the very next topic I was going to talk about is representation. You know, so you can go the film festival route, you can go representation route, or you can go to like these, you know, sales shows like NAPD, MIP, all these other types of things. So, uh, Elliot, I I would say you probably know more about representation than I would. Well, in terms of, you know, this kind of different, this seeming this three different kinds of representation here. That person was talking about a producer's rep, you know, then the other person was talking about an actor's uh, agent. So in terms of a producer's rep, it, I think it's really hard to get you, unless somebody knows who you are, or an aspect for me and Bruce, people know know us, so we were able to make phone calls and people will talk to us and, and look at our film because we've got, you know, history, but, um, with our film, we, we hired somebody who was a producer's rep, and he got us into uh, lots of places to look at our film, and, and we got offers from that, you know. So, um, I, yeah, it's hard. It's, it, it's not made to be easy. It's hard, and you just got to just kind of figure out your way in there or not, like we've been talking about before. Um, you know, somebody will see it, maybe, maybe nobody sees it, or very few people see it, like the show you were talking about, and then... Somebody at HBO looks at it and says, oh, there's something here. So you just, you just got to keep putting it out there by yourself if you can't get someone to help you. Um, but we, we literally hired somebody to help us sell our film, and, and it worked. I mean, that's the traditional model, having a producer's rep. John Carlo, you had said, uh, you know, um, it's hard for me to get somebody to watch my film. And then the second thing you said is marketing. And I'm just going to hammer the business down. I mean, those uh, Fatima and the, uh, I forget the other girl's name at Brown Girls, they had a marketing plan. They had a concept that is that somebody could just latch themselves onto and go, I can make money with this. 
you know, and it was a niche market. But sometimes these niche markets are the way to go. You know, that's, I always have been a niche person my whole life. Yeah. yeah. You know, why go, I mean, I can't make Iron Man, <laughs> you know. Uh, Elan, what do you think? Absolutely. I think you have to work whatever angle you have at that moment, um, whether it's festivals. Festivals for us got us um, into our first avenues for representation and distribution. Um, our first festival wasn't um, one of the huge festivals. What is an amazing festival called Black Star Film Festival out of Philly. Um, but that got us distribution, which got us um, into um, Comcast Xfinity um, as a streaming service for our film, Enamorata. And then also, too, just personal relationships and connections. Um, so being able to uh, leverage some connections with Issa Rae, and which end, ended on um, her also picking up our film digitally and, and also just sharing her audience with us, which I think is actually the perfect audience for, for our film, Enamorata. So I think you have to work every single angle you have and know that every space is not going to give you everything you want, but pulling together the constellation will help you um, to just create a sustainable career in this industry, which obviously is very hard. Um, but as but as an emerging filmmaker, that's what's been the most successful for me, just working every single angle that you can work um, and building momentum as you go along. Yeah, but I applaud you. You you you, you made a, a you you focused in on a particular market and you went after it. Absolutely, and very clear oh, about sure. who my audience was, um, and know and know that because you. Are, you go specific at first, um, it does give you a very beautiful opportunity to open up. And I think that is what Brown Girls did so beautifully. It was targeting a very specific audience that then opened up, and also what Insecure does, with, which is Issa Rae's show on HBO as well, um, but opens up uh, this really beautiful, broad audience and develops a new audience um, into these longstanding um, institutions and platforms. So. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, the the thing, and I keep going back to this Brown Girls because I was just, it is just this thing in my head that is the ultimate brilliance. Uh, but what I agree with you is, is that it has, it has crossover. It's like, I have absolutely nothing to do with that audience. But I loved it because they had characters that, that you could relate to in so many different markets Yet it was a niche project, similar to this Jane the Virgin. I mean, anybody can watch that show, but there's, it's half in Spanish, half in English. I mean, it could be seen throughout all of America's, you know, it's just, it's, it's a brilliant concept. I think maybe a way to wrap this up would be, you know, when I was 26, when I started to write the script and think about the movie, I wasn't thinking about the marketing and the distribution. And I think going forward for the next movie, that would be something um, that I would consider, you know, probably hiring somebody early on okay, we, you know, what, we, you know, where are you going to put the movie and who's going to, who do you want to see it? And something you can think of way before you're even, you know, thinking about getting the movie out there and the editing and... Yeah, why wouldn't you? I mean, yeah. I mean, I, it, you know, it goes back to this idea that, you know, I have a story that needs to be told. Well, that's lovely and everything, but uh, <laughs> if Jens and I are doing a project, we sit back and go, okay, what do people want? That's step one. And then you come up. I mean, we do the same when we're making products. You don't make a product and go, this needs to be made. You go, what do people want? And then how do I make how do it over, great? Almost over serve them, you know. Make and then sure. how do I make it great? Mm -hmm. Rachel, what do you got well, for us? I disagree with that. You know? oh, oh, wait, Bruce, what? Yeah, I just, you know, I made my movie not because a story had to be told, but because I wanted to tell that story, you know. And I definitely made my movie, um, uh, you know, for my enjoyment. So um, I, I think to over-marketize uh, a concept, especially when you're writing something, is, is, is problematic. You know? Well, that's fine. Uh, but I'm just speaking from a financial point of view, you know. I'm not saying to hit every single touch point just to make something that's marketable. In the, in the case of Brown Girls or Courageous, I thought those were good projects. You know, they, 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 they figured out their marketing plan, but then they also made a great project so that it had a built-in audience. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, no, 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 no. But that's the conundrum of it all. It's always was the, the conflict between the business and the creative. So that's what Bruce is speaking to. So those are always couldn't clash 
and then you know it's hard to make them to meet. So what comes first? The creative people, it's what they what's coming out of them and what they want to say, just like you keep referencing the show Brown Girls. I'm sure that was a really great idea first before it was a marketing idea because if it holds up, then creatively it really works. So it's a really hard thing for everyone and for filmmakers to make a decision on how to go about how they're going to do their art. Well, yeah, it's hard. If it were easy, yeah. everyone would be doing it. No, no, I'm sorry, yeah. certainly talk about, you know, in the, in the film world and, and then more than anything else. But well, it's just, you know, that's the, what comes first, the, uh, the creative spark or like, let me figure out who's going to buy it. Then that, that's always been the case from the get go, from the very beginning of film. It has. Mm -hmm. But if you go to the Hollywood system, they're going to start from a marketing point of view and then look for greatness. That's just my point of view. Rachel, do you have any other questions? Yeah, we've got one last question while we're talking about financing. Um, Joe Lacaro says, do you go forward and make your film or pilot and try to get financing after the fact or try to pitch to get funds beforehand? I've self-produced in the past and have hit similar roadblocks to other filmmakers when it comes to distribution and lack of sales. So does well, the money come first or after? Well, I'd have him watch those clips that we just ran in one of the clips. Uh, somebody talked about, uh, you know, uh, raising money beforehand. Uh, in others, they talked about, you talked about getting money from family and friends. Uh, you know, uh, there's, uh, I know Elliot loves to talk about how you can get money from foreign sale. Um, Elliot, you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, well, I don't know if I, I love betting money for foreign sales. I think it's a really good way to... Uh, to, to get it, get some money beforehand, but I, I mean, I don't, I'm not, I, I don't know. It's hard to say. Uh, However, you can get it. It seems like is the kind of yeah, the model. Yeah. I mean, any, any way. But isn't that the first thing you do when your project's done? Have you already tried to take your film to the foreign sale market? No, uh, we have. No, <clears throat> no we, 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 we didn't do. Sorry, go ahead, Bruce. Well, we're just we're we're fielding offers right now, and the, the you know the the most confusing thing to me is how different all these uh, distribution offers are, and you, you know some people take fifteen percent and some pe people take fifty percent, but the people that are taking fifty percent they have a lot more skin in the game. They're actually doing marketing, and you know, and you sell it you sell it to one of these people that are giving you the lion's share of the money. How invested? are they in your project or is it just sitting there in their library and you know they'll put it out when they can so and 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 you know the other thing is the deliverables on um on these projects some people they they want all the foreign versions up front you know others are very simple you just you're just giving them a quick time file and they're really taking it from there so the the deliverables that these different distributors want is like a huge thing because I'm a one-man post-production department and you know it's going to take me a, a year to to come up with these deliverables you know it's funny so, uh, yeah yeah no no so so the uh, so the ones that are, um, are kind of more supportive and are not requiring uh, all these things that you don't really need until you need them uh, like foreign versions um, I think are, um, I think are better for us as a as a small independent filmmaker. All right, as the last topic, I I, I never envisioned. Well, I should have envisioned that this conversation was going to go all film, because really I'm not interested in the film business. It's I can't believe I'm saying this now. Even you're selling you're selling the products to the. <laughs> oh, that that's irrelevant. You know, I mean, uh, and I tell everybody, you don't need my products to make great. Projects. I've yeah. told you that for ten yeah. years. Yeah. You know. First thing, <laughs> uh, you need a great story. You need great actors. You need rehearsals. You need food. I put that high on Good. the list. Have your mom do craft services if yeah. you can. Uh, well, okay. Uh, I'll have your mom do <laughs> yeah, craft yeah, services. Yeah. <laughs> but in any case, we'll bring the uh, um, I, I'm seeing binge watchable television. I, I you know, I, I, that's all I want to do. I want to do episodic content. I've kind of always wanted to do episodic content. I've made, you know, nine web series and now I'm doing episodic content here. 
I think episodic content, I, f finally, it's caught up to me. <laughs> Everything that's out there, people, you talk to anybody, are they talking about movies now? No, they're talking about, you know, House of Cards. They're talking about The Queen. They're talking about all these shows. If you say to people, what are you watching? What are they going to tell you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're not going to say movies. How do you feel about doing episodic content? I feel great about it. I think it's an, op uh, it's an opportunity for a director to write a five-hour project and direct it all himself and then cut it up into episodes. And, you know, that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing these, like, little six, uh, six episodes, like uh, Patrick yeah, Melrose. Yeah, you, know? you know, and, and I think that's a fantastic format to work in. I, yeah. I think it's more sellable now. I think that, I mean, if you really think about it, you go to a Netflix, an Amazon, yeah, they're, they're interested in movies, but I mean, from what I hear, they really want episodic content. Mm. That's really what they want. I mean, a movie is a great thing if you can get nominated for an Academy Award. It's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a marquee thing for your network. But it's, it's, I just don't think people are, I know it sounds stupid what I said, that it's a big commitment to watch a movie on Netflix, and then you go and watch nine hours right, of, right. you know, the Vikings, <laughs> but people end up doing that. Elliot? No, I think you're absolutely right. I think that's absolutely where it's going. I think there's less viewership for the Academy Awards. There's less people going to the movies except for tentpole movies. People are staying home, watching it on the big screen TVs. Um, and you know you're talking about episodes and, and and you know shows that might run for years. Bruce is talking about limited series, where the filmmaker and and this and they're all really big filmmakers. They still go for the big filmmakers. They'll 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 write an, a movie and it's six hours and they just go and make a six hour movie. I mean you don't get to make a six hour movie anywhere anymore. I mean they used to you know. They did a couple of times with Serge Leone, tried to do it once time in America. That was a six hour movie. They made it into a two hour movie. But any filmmaker now would go, look, I can tell the story at my leisure and I can tell the whole story. I don't, and it, it's a great opportunity and everybody, everybody's doing it. Every big name director's on television now. And I think that's where everything's going. I mean, I think movies are, are actually fading a little bit. Although the glamor of it, Everybody still loves the glamour of it. Even kids in, in film school, they still talk about, you know, big, big screen, they want to be on the big screen, but it's the little screen, not so little anymore, but it's the home screen now where people are staying because it's also cheaper. I've never you wanted to be it. on the big screen, man. I've always wanted the little screen. I want the eyeballs. Elon, I want you to kind of wrap this up and then we'll let Rachel see if we have any other questions. Absolutely. Um, well, I'm a playwright, and so you learn very quickly. You have to make your money where you can. <laughs> and um, so I think as a, as a dramatic writer, you have to be um, skilled at moving across genre and also let go of genre altogether. So I'm also very much interested in episodic content, um, very much interested in filmmaking, um, and very much interested in things that we're doing in, in live time on the stage. So I think all of those things together can create a really beautiful career. And I do believe, as was mentioned before, one thing leads to the other um, and, and supports the other. So I think it's all connected. But you have to work across genres. Well, we haven't, and, and we didn't really even talk about installational type of, of content, which my kid's into, you know, where it's a mixture of film and theater. And, but, you know, again, I, the, the whole theater experience is a, is a topic that, oh, I want to have with you someday, but not here. <laughs> But uh, so, Rachel, what about uh, any last questions? And we'll let you wrap it up. Oh, I think we're ready to wrap up. Do you have anything you want to say uh, to close out? Nope, it's all on you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Uh, if you have any show ideas or guests you'd like to see in future episodes, please email us at live at zacuto.com and let us know. We want to make content you want to watch. So let us know and we'll make it for you. Thank you for watching. We'll see you at the same time next week. Bye.